Speakers, member of the House, Chair and Associates, it's my great pleasure to be invited along tonight to speak for the proposition. This House believes <coughs> the pro-life movement is incompatible with feminism. Surprisingly, for an artist, I've been invited to speak on this issue with alarming regularity recently, likely following on from my research and work on abortion travel from Ireland and Northern Ireland, which is currently on show at the Copper House Gallery in Dublin. What I have learned since the beginning of work in 2010 is that abortion evokes strong opinions, but the level of debate we usually hear is restricted by easy rhetoric and marked by a blame game, as if guilt and shame are the only possible results of what is actually an incredibly common medical procedure. I shall try and steer clear of these tropes this evening and instead I'll take me two main points to illustrate why the pro-life movement is indeed incompatible with feminism. Firstly, I'll map, up, map out my understanding of the definition of feminism as we know it in 2013. And secondly, I'll show you how a pro-choice stance is really the only possible stance of a self proclaimed feminist and therefore point out the incompatibilities. So, first up is feminism, that wonderfully polarising word. Recently at a Belfast Feminist Network meeting, we were discussing the ways in which we all try to rebut unwelcome and persistent attention, especially for lone or in a noisy bar or club. There were many suggestions, from polite to the profane, but seemingly the most overwhelmingly effective method is to tell your pursuer, I'm a feminist. <laughs> However, not only does being a self proclaimed feminist repel people, it also allows us to be challenged daily on sorting issues like rape and abortion. Yay. <laughs> Seriously though, if you're going to be a feminist, you have to be prepared to fight your tiny underrepresented corner all the time. And these battles come in many guises. So firstly, a dictionary definition. Feminism. The advocacy of women's rights on the grounds of political, social and economic equality to men. I think this covers a lot of ground, but there are some important contemporary editions, I feel I should point out. Feminism was also a belief in crime and gender parity, specifically the right of women to control their own destinies, including bodily autonomy and reproductive health. Thirdly, feminism is a social and political movement based on the radical notion that women are people too, and demonised by the pathologically vicious and evangelical worldwide religious right wing. Feminism is also a term uh, rejected by minority and working class progressive women whose concerns, efforts and agitations towards gender equality have been historically ignored or dismissed by progressive movements overwhelmingly white, heterosexual, wealthy standard bearers. <coughs> Feminism is also the acceptance that a culture of life demands respect for the lives and choices of the already born. Feminism is a vibrant social movement more than 100 years old and made up of individuals who, although they sometimes passionately differ on the details, believe in one overarching idea. Female, and for that matter, male liberation, which I think we can all agree. So now that I frame my own understanding of the word feminism, <coughs> let's see how we deal with the dreaded abortion question. So secondly, pro-choice and feminist, or Yep, I'm that outspoken, quite <coughs> secular pro-choice feminist they warned you about. It seems clear to me that social and political equality can never be achieved without a woman be able, being able to choose whether or not she is ready for motherhood. A state that forces women to be pregnant against their will or continue a pregnancy despite life-threatening dangers is not a state dedicated to social equality. Rather, it appears bent on bodily control of half the population. There are many situations in which a woman can find herself unwillingly pregnant. Sometimes this woman may decide she actually, on reflection, wants to continue with the pregnancy. Sometimes she will decide, upon weighing up her options, she would be <coughs> to be pregnant. If this woman lives in a country where abortion is illegal, we are then asking her to put herself in the hands of underground, unlicensed abortion clinics, unlicensed online abortion pills, no aftercare, risk to her health, and even in some cases, criminality and imprisonment. Given that a woman is fertile for at least 30 years and can be pregnant a few times every month, and the only 100% reliable way of not getting pregnant is not having sex with a fertile man, then it's not surprising that many women find themselves pregnant unexpectedly. And these are the women who wanted to have sex and are in relative control of their sex lives. As a feminist, what should we offer these women at this stage? Recriminations? Prosecution? Or even pregnancy as a punishment for having sex? No, I think you'll find that a feminist space would encourage these women to seek out a safe, legal and healthy way of choosing whether or not to continue. Feminists are not pro-abortion. Instead, as a movement, we support reproductive freedoms defined as the condition <coughs> under which women are able to make a truly voluntary choice about their reproductive lives. <coughs> we support women who do and women who don't have abortions. 
We support women who seek other options. We support two men or two women who want to have a child. And we support greater access to adoption and fair infertility treatment. A feminist has a collective responsibility to other women <coughs> to also respect that other feminists may have a different view. If a fellow feminist does not believe in abortion, that fellow feminist is respected and is allowed to make that decision. Equally, if she believes in abortion, is the best course of action, we should respect that also. However, once you legislate against abortion, the ability to choose the course of her own life is removed and the right <coughs> of bodily autonomy is gone. Let us also remember for a moment that feminism does not end at national borders. My fellow speakers should take care to remember that most women in the world have little or no control over the conditions in which they have sex. Horrifically, a 12-year-old girl in South Africa is more likely to be raped than know how to read. Marital rape is still sanctioned in most countries um, outside of the Western world. Rape culture is still prevalent, including in this one. We ought to be fighting for everyone's right to safe and legal abortions if they so wish. We should also be struggling for a world in which women can actively choose when they have sex. Susan Sharon, author of Abortion Through a Feminist Ethic Lens, says, Women's freedom to choose abortion is also linked with their ability to control their own sexuality. Women's permanent <coughs> status often prevents them from refusing men sexual access to their bodies. Can someone claim to belong to a social justice movement that actually supports social injustice? Article 2 of the European Convention on Human Rights <coughs> includes a positive duty to prevent foreseeable loss of life. Yet the prevention of access to a safe and legal abortion can cause a woman to lose her life, as we have seen so tragically illustrated this year by Sevilla. I have no problem with a single feminist upholding his or her own pro-life opinions. However, to enshrine these pro-life opinions into law or as a lobbying movement, as Ireland has, is to enforce their opinions on everyone rather than to allow them to choose their own path towards or away from motherhood. One of the other main problems of being pro-life hunters when trying to negotiate feminism is the importance it proffers the potential life over the actual life. As if the potential of a new life would surely be better than this existing woman. The pro-life stance fetishes the fetus to the complete obliteration of the woman. Yet in truth, the fetus cannot sustain itself and is utterly reliant on the woman's body until it is born. Few things are more critical to the maintenance of patriarchy than controlling a woman's reproduction. In conclusion, we can see clearly feminism enshrines the principles of equality, gender and sexual parity, and as a result, social movements are necessary to achieve equality between men and women with the understanding that gender always intersects with other hierarchies. But we've also learned that feminism is a movement which, through wide-ranging wide in opinion, should be united in its attempts to attain liberation and emancipation for all expressions of gender. With this understanding of feminism in mind, you can see that enforced pregnancy, which is absolutely central to the beliefs of the pro life movement, clearly contravenes any attempt at social equality between the sexes. Bodily autonomy and a right to life are enshrined in international law, but are clearly trampled over by the attempts, the attempts of the pro life movement to muffle, muffle these women's voices and shame their choices. Finally, the representation of the pro life movement of the fetus as an independent entity completely separate from the body of the woman in the province is disingenuous and misleading in the extreme and only serves to negate the role of every woman in her pregnancy rather than enshrine her rights as a human, which any feminist movement would move to do. These reasons and many more I have not time to go into this evening are why this house should indeed believe that the pro life movement. Yahoo answers. Um, now, there were many answers from Yahoo as 
to uh, what feminism is, but my two favourites I have selected to share with you here this evening. So here goes, brace yourselves. The first one goes like this. Feminism is women who hate men, are fat, angry lesbians, <laughs> with inferiority complexes, most feminists are radicals, a few are humanists who haven't caught up to the feminist deception yet. <laughs>
sufficient explanation for denying access to the services those women need to control their lives. While better support and services might make a difference to some women, and in a, you know, absolutely, they are not a fix-all. To suggest that they are is at best naive and at worst willful avoidance of the fact that no one is better equipped to decide what is right for an individual woman than that woman herself. Wow. No thanks. Feminism is about trusting women with that choice. So-called pro-life anti-choice feminists claim in some cases that legal abortion is anti-motherhood. But what makes a better mother than a woman who, after careful consideration, exercising her own free will, elects to be one, rather than a woman who was forced or coerced into becoming a mother? True feminists, as we have said, hold a woman's right to choose as sacred, and not just in relation to reproduction, but choice in every single aspect of her life, from her career to her relationships, to whatever it is that she gets to choose upon. No, thank you. Being feminist is about accepting and supporting the fact that women alone know what is best for their lives and their destinies, even when we don't necessarily agree with their decisions. <coughs> Not trying to convince them otherwise, guilt them into submission, or limiting or forbidding them access to the things that allow them to control their fertility. Anything less is simply not the feminist way. True feminism is about creating societies where feminism ceases to exist, where all men are created equal, automatically applies to women too, and is a living, breathing, glorious reality. True feminism understands that women must have agency over their lives, not just a little bit, or sometimes, or almost, but always, in every situation. Some pro-life feminists claim legal abortion reduces respect for women as citizens. Really? I'd be more inclined to say that lack of women in government, inadequate childcare, and the lack of equal pay for equal work are far more damaging to the levels of respect female citizens are held in in our society than the lack of access to free, safe abortion, or indeed the access to free, safe abortion. True feminism knows that strong, free women do not weaken societies or families, they empower them. In fact, they are the driving force behind them. I would like to leave you um, with the following words from Faye Waddleton. She's a former president of Planned Parenthood in the US. And she says, reproductive freedom is critical to a whole range of issues. If we can't take charge of this most personal aspect of our lives, we can't take care of anything. It shouldn't be seen as a privilege or as a benefit, but as a fundamental human right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary, for your final speech. I'm ready to continue the case for the, uh, the opposition and our final guest speaker, uh, Vice President of Planning for the Sal Yanni. She often 
child is forced to quit at an early point in her pregnancy. She has no provision for maternity leave. She cannot get unemployment compensation under our laws because the laws hold that she is not eligible for employment, being pregnant, and therefore ineligible for unemployment compensation. For women with serious medical needs, she went on to add, there is no duty for employers to rehire women if they must drop out to carry a pregnancy to term. And of course, this is especially hard on the many women, myself included, who are heads of their own households and must provide for their already existing children. And Whittington also clearly saw the buying low income face when experiencing unplanned pregnancy when she said, at the same time, she can get no welfare to help her at a time when she has no employment, she has no unemployment compensation, and she's not eligible for getting a job. You see, Miss Whittington wasn't looking for equality for women. She wasn't looking for relief from discrimination. She was advocating relief from pregnancy. And as the wizard said, so many women <laughs> are left <laughs> <laughs> on their own. Now, speaking as feminists, it's interesting to me to hear the argument that there is no way you can be feminist and, and pro-life at the same time because all of the early feminists, without exception, that go back to the 17 and 18 hundreds, were in fact pro-life. You're saying Susan B. Anthony was not feminist, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Um, Victoria Woodhull, all these other wonderful women that we had here in the States, were not feminists. Interesting. They actually founded the entire movement. But, when looking at this, okay. <laughs> <laughs> let's look at one of these early, early feminists, Tennessee, Tennessee Classen. She was quoted as saying, pregnancy is not a disease, but a beautiful office of nature. Her sister, Victoria Woodhull, who wrote in the 1700s and was the first woman to ever run for president, she said, Every woman who knows that if she were free, she would never bear an unwished for child, nor think of murdering one before its birth. She was also a free love advocate, just saying. <laughs> freedom. You see, early feminism all over the world was about freedom from patriarchal oppression. <coughs> and to achieve equality, we needed to change society to accept women. I think we can all agree on that no matter where we stand on the issue of abortion. They decided, in the second wave of feminism, that somehow we had to change women to be accepted by society. And that's exactly what abortion is going to Abortion forces us to fit into a male model in society in order to achieve equality. We have to be wombless creatures if we want to have equal pay, equal education, equal advancement of any kind. No, thank you. So, when looking at this, there was one, one argument that Ms. Weddington made that really struck me personally. She said that a woman couldn't possibly complete her education if she became pregnant. I was pregnant my third year at university. Unexpectedly, I might add. Quite unexpectedly. <laughs> and I think I did what anyone else in that situation would do after cursing for a while. I looked around to see what kind of survival mode I had. What, what would I have? Where would I live? Would there be daycare available? Would there be a job that I could afford to feed my child for? Would there be, um, well, in the U.S., we have to think about you know, health insurance. You're fortunate that you don't have to. We're working on that. Um, but I looked around and thought, what am I going to do? And I found out that on my university, there was no housing for undergraduate students who became pregnant. There was daycare, ostensibly, but it went to tenured professors, those on the tenure track, associate professors, graduate students, and dangling at the bottom of the food chain for undergraduates, and there was no space at the time, but I could always put my name on the waiting list. Cross my legs, I suppose, keep the child in there until it back, they could still put on the waiting list. <laughs> now, I was very fortunate because I had a very supportive family, and I was able to move to a smaller campus in the university system, where my mother said, if you go to night classes, then I will watch the child. And um, I found a way to somehow we maneuvered into health insurance. I'm not exactly sure how that happened. So and we found a very small apartment that was quiet, which was very hard in the university town where I was once. <laughs> so looking at all these situations, I know I was very fortunate to be in a position where I didn't have to choose an abortion. Now, might I add that at the time, I was raised by very liberal hippie parents. Um, they were very active against war and the death penalty, and I was too at that age. But I was still pro choice in the case of abortion. Had a bumper sticker on the car, gave money to now, the whole nine yards. But at that point, I thought to myself, well, you know, 
And they don't really have a compelling reason to have an abortion. Well, that lack of compelling reason has a name. Her name is Emily, and she's in her first year at university as well. When you look at the statistics, so few people were in the kind of situation in which I was. They don't have these resources and support. If you consider, I looked at the statistics for people here in Ireland and why they're having abortions. No, thank you. And um, I think that's one question that's, that's just not being mentioned tonight. Why are the women having abortions? Is it because they want equal rights? Is they want they want to have freedom of their own body? That's not it at all. That has absolutely nothing to do with why women have abortions. So thank you. The reasons women have abortions, according to a study um, that was done actually here by someone here, Evelyn, Evelyn McMahon, or Evelyn Mann. Yeah, yes, sorry. Um, he's American, as I tell you. Um, <laughs> She did a study and she found really that they're very similar to the reasons why women have abortions in the United States. The reasons, career job, stigma of raising the child alone, the child's needs, financially unread. So those are the reasons why women are having abortions here. Thank you. The reasons why women are having abortions in the United States are very similar. They say 75%, because we have so many millions more, obviously, than you do, 75% say that having a baby would interfere with work, school, or the ability to care for the dependents. 75% of them say that they cannot afford a child. 69% would qualify under the government standards as being economically disadvantaged. And 44% of all abortions in the United States perform on college-age women. What we're finding here, no thank you. What we're finding here is we have offered the solution of abortion to women, but abortion is not the solution. It's a symptom of a greater problem. It's a symptom that's a no thank you. Society has no thank you. Society has washed their hand of us, no thank you, by saying it's our body and it's our choice. We've now said it's our problem. And by doing that, society has been let off the hook, has absolutely no responsible to help care for a pregnant woman who may be low income, no thank you, or disadvantaged in some way, shape, or form. As pro-life feminists, we must stand up for these women and stand up for equality, stand up for equal pay, stand up for equal rights, and that includes our sisters who may be pregnant or parenting. <coughs> Thank you. For 40 years, 40 years now, we have been able to do this experiment with women. And we've been arguing with the other side, the other side being her choice feminists. And so many pro-life people say, well, what about the baby? And then the pro-choice side says, well, what about the woman? What about the baby? What about the woman? My gosh, people have been living on this for 40 years. What I'm saying is, when someone comes to you and says, what about the woman? You say, what about the woman? What does she need? What can we do to help her situation? We need to offer her something more than just abortion on demand. We need to offer her real resources at work. We need to offer her real sources, real resources that are woman-centered that challenge the status quo and not accept abortion on demand as the answer. These 11 women who have gone to England every day, have they been relieved of their poverty? Have they been relieved of discrimination? Have they been relieved from their mental health issues? Have they been relieved from their abusers? No, they have not been relieved of any of this. Abortion has masked rather than solved the problems women face. It is a reflection that we have failed to meet needs women, and women deserve something better than abortion from all of us. I want to thank uh, Sally and Marie for a fine speech and for coming all the way from the States uh, to do this tonight. And now to uh, move on to the final speaker from the proposition, uh, Junior Officer, English Literature, Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, before I go I would like to lay out another analogy for you that I demonstrate my train of thought. I would place myself as quite left of the political centre, where that where exactly I place myself as a matter, but I would always compel myself to engage with the economic arguments of the far right, those who describe themselves as politically far right, not the fascist and racist and that can be left behind. 
But I always look at them as people who were genuine, like people who like, did not have to be in the pocket of the extremely wealthy to advocate for a libertarian distribution or a libertarian system of economics. And I still do to this day. I did the same with pro-life. I did the same with that school. I tried my very best to analyze it and try to see if it was genuine, trying to see that they could have the best interests of women have had. And while I no doubt, no doubt, while I do not doubt the sincerity of some of the speakers we have heard tonight, I feel they are incredibly misguided, and I myself have stopped trying to see from their point of view. So what I believe that misogyny, subjugation, lads being dicks, whatever you want to call us, is rooted in biological difference. These are manifold. And they, throughout history, have enjoyed times of being in vogue when they were the most prevalent form. Sorry, I thought you were going to be away. <laughs> <laughs> Things such as physical superiority when unchecked by a decent society is exercised freely. This was a mark of importance, this dominance. From this, superior intelligence was inferred. This was compounded by exclusive education and exclusive access to wealth. There we have it, an extremely unnuanced and overly general account of why misogyny still exists to this day, but one that still has a fair bit of truth to us. Now, the feminist movement has worked so hard to shift focus away from these arbitrary a priori attributes that characterize men and women. These attributes that make you no less or no more of a person are forever strived to be shown as unimportant to the content of your character. But there is one that remains, one that still gnaws away at the goal of actually creating equality between both sexes. It is the charge put by nature to women, the blessing as well as the curse that they are forced to deal with. The charge of bearing children, of being, the, of being like the vessel of carrying on the species. This is not something that we can mitigate easily. In terms of physical domination, like most women here could bulk up and beat the crap out of most lads that are in the chamber at the minute. But like, <laughs> pregnancy is not offered the same protein and free weights kind of luxury as that is. <laughs> because anyone who claims the label of feminist, this is the goal that I put to you. We must mitigate against the unmitigable, uh, unmitigable whatever that word, whatever the negative of that word is. <laughs> we must allow individual women the ability to mitigate, uh, mitigate against this if they so choose. Because if that is not the case, if we do not give ourselves that goal, the movement which strives for women's liberation holds a process, process which in this case was not consented to as one that supersedes all in terms of importance, in terms of what should be a woman's priority. I think that's incredibly detrimental to a movement which claims to have women's interests at heart. Because for them, in that case, women's liberation is contingent on the fact that you are not pregnant. Contingent on the fact that you are not bearing a child. Now let me be unequivocal of what we've heard from the opposition bench. I do not care about polarization. I do not care about alienation. And I do not care that the feelings of someone who wants to enforce their own morals and judgments on a particular woman, that those feelings are hurt. I do not care that those people will exist as a result of this belief. Germaine Greer, that was brought up there, the, like, the, the feminist, yeah, she's a feminist. She's also a horrible individual for her comments. <laughs> I think, like, when you say something like that, you undo all the good that you've done and push yourselves into the sidelines. That's not someone that we should hold up as someone who is, like, a proud person of the movement, <laughs> someone who holds the values that are there to be, to be espoused. Because, and before I do, I'll take it. Well, like, again, this goes back to my don't care part. <laughs> who believe that it is murder. Don't have Don't do it. If you fall pregnant, then bear that child to turn. Like, that is what the answer to that is. And the only thing is that you choose to the answer that you must always give. Because let's have a look at the rhetoric of the moderate pro life side, ones who avoid the disgraceful tactics of youth defense. Such as groups like Feminists for Lives, and like I do not doubt the sincerity of this group. Well, let's look at some of their taglines that like refuse to choose between women and children, and that women deserve better. Indeed, I was in this very chamber last year and heard your president, Ms. Sarah Foster, outline a similar case that you yourself came up here and gave. Two things to this. First of all, you have chosen. An implicit choice is a choice nonetheless. 
For you to claim the tagline that you refuse to choose between women and children, you remove yourself from this debate and hold no opinion whatsoever. If you do not have abortion, you have made the choice that the rights of an unborn child supersede that of the mother, who without which that would not exist in the first place. You have made that choice, please don't pretend otherwise. Secondly, I think you believe you are completely misguided about the motiv motivations. And this is what you spoke about at the end of your last speech. Like, should there be a coerced choice? Should people ever be under conversion? coercion? No, we don't think that's good. We try to mitigate against coercion in all circumstances, including abortion. And I think the context which the group Feminist for Life comes from is extremely important. Like, she outlines, uh, the last speaker outlines the, like, the, the, the case that, the, law, that the, the lawyer put forward in advocating for Roe v. Wade. That might have something to do with the way the US treats its workers like scum and has absolute contempt for them. The goals that you want to see, providing better services for women, are not mutually exclusive with also providing them the right to choose. And the fact that we must all face, however chilling it might be, particularly in the context of the entirely vicious pro-life dominated media space that we have in this country, is that there is the, some women who simply do not want to bear a child. Not for economic reasons. But for the very choice that they think that I have some life left to live where I do not have to care for another human being. That is legitimate. You have no answer to that that can be put through the lens of what is best for the woman. Because in that case, if that is her motivations, then the choice to have an abortion is what's best for her. Not some rhetoric about better maternity leave, a better maternity leave. We can do that for another day. Is feminism, can you be a pro-lifer and be a feminist? And I honestly think that 